Hey guys, welcome to the Launchpad, and thanks for joining me with the rest of the Rehab Rebels. If you don't already know, the Rehab Rebels are on a mission to launch out of the rat race, and we're committed to doing it together. If entrepreneurship, real estate, and passive income mean as much to you as they do to us, then you're in the right place. Sit back, buckle up, and prepare for launch. If you're enjoying our episodes, don't forget to subscribe to The Launchpad and like us on Spotify. Just tap one of the links below. By subscribing, you'll get new episodes delivered straight to your library every week. I'm here today with Bernie Richter. Bernie Richter and I met in 2016. Uh, We were in Matt Bartle's office and he introduced me to Bernie and he said, I want you to meet this old guy who has been around the real estate world forever and he knows everything there is about real estate. And I want you to sit down with him and and pick his brain and have a conversation with him. So that's what I knew leading up to my my first interaction with Bernie. And he definitely lived up to the hype. Bernie has, has seen every real estate situation that you can imagine. And most of them he's seen five times or more. And he he's just been uh, he's been a joy to work with. He is a wealth of information. He's funny and uh, he's become a friend over these last seven years. And he truly is one of the the best assets that we have at North Oak Investment. Uh, With his decades of experience, he has helped us make sound decisions and navigate challenging situations. And his uh, access to to his knowledge is truly invaluable. So, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to, to everyone getting a chance to meet Bernie and uh, hearing from him, his perspective, and how he got into this business. So without further ado, Bernie Richter. I've been looking forward to today's episode for a while now. I'm here today with Bernie Richter, the man, the myth, the legend. The only reason North Oak Investment is here today is this man right here. Bernie is not only a living encyclopedia of real estate, He's also one of the most well-known and well-loved lenders in the Kansas City area. Bernie began his career in the mortgage industry in 1965 at the age of 25. Since then, he's financed thousands of projects in the Kansas City area and has even financed some properties twice, once as a new construction loan and then again many years later as a rehab loan. Bernie is a proud member of the Rockhurst High School graduating class of 1957 and the Rockhurst University's class of 1961. Bernie, thank you for joining us here today. You've had so many great experiences that we'll have to have you join us several times to unpack more of the experiences that you've had than we can do just in today's episode. For today's conversation, I'd like to get the story of how you got into the mortgage industry and how North Oak came to be. Well, I had a lot of jobs when I was in school, worked my way through school. One of the odd jobs was I actually uh, measured houses for a condemnation of an appraiser with a contract for a condemnation work uh, for a a, a highway system in Missouri. And and when did you get into that? Is this right after graduating from from Rockhurst University? Uh, Well, I I did some of that while I was still in in school. Uh, But after school, I continued to do it. It was a part-time adventure. uh, got in the Army Reserves, had six months active duty, came back from that, spent five and a half years uh, as a reservist. That's a two-year summer camp. Uh, uh, while there, I uh, uh, became I, I promoted to E5, and I ran the payroll uh, section in our unit. Uh, my first real job, when I came back from my active duty in, in the Army, uh, I, uh, I was employed by a public accounting firm, and uh, gosh, I was only there about a week. And I got a call with an offer to uh, to uh, run the books for a, 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 pre, a funeral pre-need plan. Uh, the owner thought he was it was a new concept, and he wanted to take it nationwide. And I was going to be his accountant. Well, uh, and he had some other businesses, so I basically got hands-on uh, uh, work uh, uh, in accounting work and bookkeeping and payrolls, et cetera, which was invaluable later in my life. I didn't grasp it at the time, so. But after doing that for two years, I realized I, I didn't want to sit and just run a set of books for the rest of my life. Uh, that was, there's more to life than that. So 
uh, I had measured houses for a, this real estate appraiser, and I asked him, what's real estate all about? And he suggested I go to work for a mortgage lender, and then I would see all the aspects in real estate, and I could, I could pick something that might appeal to me. So uh, I went to work for a mission investment company in 1965, and uh, I, I learned how to make uh, buyer's loan, 30-year loans to buyers. And after, after I learned that, uh, a builder came to our company and, and wanted some construction loans. And a lot of his uh, houses he was building in those days were a lot of build jobs. A builder had two or three models, or probably two models, and, uh, and he sold build jobs off those models. And that's the way the, the business was. And so. Gosh, we're, we're, we're making the, the, the buyer's loans, we're getting access to the buyer through the builder, we're making the builder a construction loan, and, and, and I, was, I enjoyed doing that. So uh, uh, after being at Mission Investment Company about six years, the owner uh, told me he wanted me to learn commercial lending. He had financed 19 strip shopping centers in, uh, in the area, and he wanted me to learn that business. So I. I started learning it, and I soon decided that just didn't have any long-term appeal for me. So, what uh, was it about those loans that turned you off? Oh, you spend a year working on a deal, and it might blow up. And then I was, uh, I'm more a uh, action guy, and and uh, 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 anyway, it, it it had no appeal for me, and uh, that's what he wanted me to do. So, what am I going to do now? I I don't want to do that. That's what he wants me to do. Uh, I've got these builders, these very successful builders I'm financing, and their clients. And so uh, we were uh, getting our money from banks for the construction loans. So I went to a couple of the bankers and said, "Look, if I uh, 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 w would you uh, would you do business with me if if I was doing business with these same builders?" And four banks said they would. And so I uh, <laughs> I never thought I'd have my own business. So I I was almost forced to. Uh, uh, to do what I enjoy doing, so I started North Oak Investment Company in 1972. I, uh, I asked the attorney, uh, could it be Bernard Investment Company, but there was already one of those in St. Louis, so I had to have a name and I had to have it quick, and my office was on North Oak, so it was North Oak Investment, so that's, that's how that name came to be. So, uh, so I started the business with these uh, two, the business up in Gladstone, Missouri, there weren't many mortgage lenders that far north yet. Gladstone was kind of out in the boondocks. I was at 6718 North Oak, and I was way out there in rural in 1972. And uh, so anyway, I, I got started, and that's that's how North Oak Investment started, and I just kept plugging away. Were, were they all construction loans at that time, or did you do any consumer loans? No, I was I was making the, the loan to the builder, and I was always making the loan, and the loan to their buyers. Uh, times change. I was making other construction loans, so uh, not only was I making loans to the builders, I, I found some other avenues to make construction loans, primarily to uh, some people building their own home, which most banks won't touch that person, and it uh, made perfectly good sense to me, so I was able to make those loans. There were some companies, uh, Standard Homes was the division of a lumber company, and they were, for the lack of a better term, they had kits. If you bought the, if you, they gave mm -hmm. you the plan, you basically bought all, most of your materials from them. That was that's what they wanted to do, sell a lot of materials, mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, they'd send the customer over to me, and I'd get him approved for a long-term loan, and then I would make him the construction loan. So I'd I'd go to the bank with this uh, the guy's going to build his own home, but he's credit approved, and here are the numbers, and, and uh, so that evolved. So I had standard homes, I had uh, presidential homes. So anyway, I'm, I'm making a lot of construction loans, and uh, and I got I got out of the uh, doing the permanent loans. So I just hung in there doing construction loans and did that for several decades, and I enjoyed the business. So when you say you got out of doing the permanent loans, did, you, did North Oak Investment Company ever do permanent loans? Well, I made them and sold them. Uh, for example, at that time, uh, many of the savings and loans, uh, First Federal, uh, I did business with a lot of savings and loans. And uh, so I would uh, I would get a loan application from someone that wanted a loan, and I'd write it up, and I'd send it down to the savings and loan, and they'd approve it. They'd get their own appraisal, but uh, but I'd get the, I had the app, and so they'd bought, I made the loan, they'd buy it from me. 
they committed to buy it from me. And these were owner-occupied 30-year mortgages? Well, these were going to be to people who were going to owner-occupy the home, yes. Okay. Yeah, so so I did those. I was just a regular mortgage banker, but I was selling the loans to the savings alone, so I'd have to make the loan, close the loan, go to the bank and borrow the money to fund the loan. That's called warehousing. Uh, two or three weeks later, I'd get all the recorded papers and the title policy, and then I would deliver that loan to the savings and loan, and they'd review it, and then they'd buy it from me by paying off the loan I had at the bank to make the loan to the buyer. A tremendous amount of work, uh, all for 1%. <laughs> so I, I got out of that. Uh, uh, I focused on the construction lending. Why, why was construction lending a better business? Oh, so I was, uh, I'd make a nice fee. And, and to me, it was, uh, since that's all I was doing, it, 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 was, it was easier for me to do my one thing over and over and over. Why were you just getting a 1% fee on the consumer loans, and then you're able to get a better fee on the construction loan? Well, I might also get 1% on the construction loan in those days. So that's one and one's two. <laughs> so it was all the same property. I mean, it was it was a. Uh, it, it's just it's just what I did. Okay, at the time. so you would make the construction loan to the builder, and then you would make the the end loan to the when, buyer. When the house was finished, I made the loan to the buyer. Okay, so you then decide if you're making the same fee on both. Why? I know you you ended up getting out of the consumer loan and not making that end loan. Why did you work. get out of that? Well, I t told you, I made the loan to the buyer, then I had to go to the bank and borrow the money, and do the warehouse loan, deliver the loan, tremendous amount of work. I was a one-man office, so one man can't do everything, and and I was making more and more construction loans, so I just but got out of the permanent lending business. Didn't you have all those same problems with the construction loan? What, no, why well, didn't the different, they were different animals. Uh, the, the permanent loans was a different animal. Plus, uh, the world was evolving. Here comes Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and all these people. And, and uh, the permanent lending business became a business where you either did a lot of them or you did none of them. It was almost a volume business. Loans are made, booked, sold in the marketplace. As a one-man office, I can't do all that. So I faded out of that and stayed with the construction lending. One man could do construction lending. And did you, were you still facing the warehousing problem? The damn warehousing problem wouldn't make an end loans. So the, I don't understand that. Can, can I had can, banks. Can, I borrowed. I made construction loans. I'd have to go to a bank and and uh, borrow the money from the bank to make the construction loan. I wasn't sitting around here with <laughs> well all the money to finance all these things. I, all my loan, but I was a, I was doing this business. I was in business for a while. I had a I had four banks that allowed me to start with them. I grew my number of banks. You know, if you if you're a good customer at the bank for several years, uh, it, you you pick up some more banks. So uh, can you? I'm 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 still not understanding. Can you talk us through the warehousing situation? How did that differ from the capital source of the construction loans? What was the key well, difference? In it's those? all a bank. <laughs> it's all a bank. But I didn't want to go through the work of making the buyer loans. Uh, there were different banks doing that. There are warehouse lines at banks. Normally, you use bigger banks for that. But but just the, uh, I didn't. I, I was making enough construction loans that I didn't have time to do both, and it was harder and harder for a one-man mortgage banker to be in the permanent loan business. So I faded out of it. It's okay. just it was just the times, and I was happier doing it. I'd rather do the construction loans. Permanent loans are you're just doing it out of a manual. <laughs> you had to have 37 pieces of paper to make the permanent loan. There's, it's, it's. Well, I would say it's, it's not as fun as a construction loan. There's, there's a, uh, it, it's just a cookie cutter. Uh, cookie cutter is not the right word, but, but permanent loans. I didn't want to do this like bookkeeping. I didn't want to do permanent loans the rest of my life. It just didn't, just didn't fire me up. Is that the disclosures and all of the paperwork? Well, all the pay, you have to do all the paperwork on every deal. It's, and that's it's, more than on a construction loan. Construction loan is different. Everyone's a little different, so every property is different. Uh, to me, it was more—I don't want to say entertaining, but uh, but I enjoyed construction lending where I didn't enjoy the permanent loans. Plus, the permanent loan business didn't fit my operation as a one-man office with a part-time secretary. Just, didn't, just couldn't do it. Just didn't want to do it. How, how were the, these financed? So the, How do you mean? 
were they? Did you do these loans in your name, and the bank put up part of the money, and you put up part of the money? How did no, the how did no, the financing no. work? North Oak Investment Company made the loan. Okay, so originated down to the, the bank paper. and North Oak borrowed the money, and the collateral was a loan. Okay, it's real simple. I did that for several years. Uh, once I got out of the permanent loans, and uh, and, uh, and and so now I'm 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 essentially at the bank. I'm the borrower with the. Uh, and the collateral was all these construction loans that I made. Well, that worked for a, quite a while. How much skin did you have to put in the game? Oh, there was no skin. Yeah, okay. No, but I, but my name's on the note. Oh, so uh, so uh, uh, we live in a world of business cycles. So we had a rates were going up. I got into mortgage business in 1965. Home loans were at five and a quarter. It went up. I didn't see five and a quarter again until four or five years ago. When it went through five and a quarter and went to three, I never saw 3% in my life. I saw 17. <laughs> well, that was a year <laughs> you put your feet up on the desk and read trade journals because there's no business, and I'm a s- small little one-man off. That's the only way I survived. Uh, and, 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 you know, it's, it, gets, it gets fast, it gets slow. It's, it's a cyclical business, and it's a... It's, it's a so I got caught in, in, a, in a recession in 1978. Uh, uh, interest rates went above 8%. We had a usury law in Missouri. The limit was 8%. It was illegal to make a loan above 8%. Now you're getting the discount points and all kinds of crazy things. And, and so the business slowed down. But when it slowed down dramatically and fairly quickly, I'm caught with all these construction loans. And down at the bank, I'm the borrower. Well, I had builders dropping like flies. You, you, go, you go kill a whole new home market for a year or two, some of the builders don't make it. <laughs> That's my collateral, and these guys are dropping. So uh, so what did you do? How did you get out of that situation? Well, I, uh, I, uh, I got all the houses sold. Uh, the bankers understood they didn't want the house. So, uh, so I got rid of, uh, there were about 40 houses. I got rid of all of them. And... Uh, and uh, then I went down, visited with the banks about, uh, the banks basically got all our principal uh, back. I got rid of the houses. They didn't, they didn't come out of the bank, do any work. I did all the work. I uh, made no money for a year or two. And these were all new construction new loans? New construction, You yeah. weren't doing rehab loans no, back then? No, 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 no. So no, how no. did that happen? How, how did you well, get into doing rehab loans? Well, that came later. Uh, that, that gets me out of the box in 1978. So finally, uh, I... Uh, I had a meeting with all the bankers and told them that I, you know, I, I wanted to continue in business and uh, I wanted to do business with them. And, and so we, we worked out a formula, and, uh, and, uh, but I made a change in the way I was doing that business. From that day forward, uh, I no longer went down to the bank and borrowed the money in my name, pledging the collateral. I now sold the loan to the bank and serviced the loan for them. So the next recession came along, it wasn't my loan and I wasn't on the hook. That didn't mean I, I tried to work the problems out, but in, in new construction lending, when you hit a recession, it, it's, it's a tough bag of business. Uh, you, you know, The recession comes, the rates are going up, the market stops, and the builders hadn't finished the house yet. By the time he gets the house finished, there's no buyer, and it's a new house, you know. So that that is, Different than uh, uh, rehab lending, which which well now you asked me about rehab lending. So, I did these new construction loans for about 25 years, and uh, uh, one of my clients had a Christmas party, and my wife and I went to the party, and I met the, uh, the fellow's brother, and uh, they started. Uh, they told me they wanted to rehab houses and and they wanted a loan. And I don't do that. I don't do rehab. I do new construction. Well, they just kept chewing on me and chewing on me and and uh, finally I said it's uh, okay all right I'll, I'll do your loan it's the same deal as new construction loan I'm uh, uh, I have the the lot just happens to have a house on it I'm getting a first mortgage uh, praises out I make it a conservative loan and, uh, and and so I made him a loan and I charged him the same fee that I was charging for the construction loan and they said that was fine that was fine so uh, we did one, and they sold it. And they came back at me, wanted to do another one. And I said, well, it worked out, so I did another one. And 
Then they did two or three more. And then uh, one of them called me up and he said, you know, I've been thinking, uh, uh, we're successful uh, rehabbing these houses and we're doing all the work ourselves. You know, if, if we got a crew, we could, we could do more volume. I put the pencil on this. I think, I think we could do a lot better if we got a crew and did more houses. And he, I said, well, fine, go for it. And so he went to his partner and his partner said he didn't want to do that. <laughs> partner just wanted to keep, keep doing it himself. And so they split. Partnerships split because you have different, you know, they like each other, but they just had different goals. Their goals changed. So uh, now I got two customers. So <laughs> the customer that wanted to do all the work uh, bought a house in Waldo, and the first day he owned the house, he had a, he had a dumpster delivered, and he had two fellows in there cleaning the house out, and a young man named Steve went to the house and approached these workers and said, do you all own the house? No, he told them how to find the owner. Steve went over to the owner and he said, I wanted to buy this house. How much did you pay for the house? The fellow told him, he said, I'll pay you 10,000 more than you paid if you sell it to me right now. Oh. So my client called me up and said he wanted to do this deal. And, uh, and, 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 uh, and he says, but Steve will need a loan. <laughs> so <laughs> Steve came to see me, and I, I, I made Steve a loan on the very same house that I just closed on. So I made two loan fees on the same house <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> I want more of those deals. So anyway, so, the, so, now, I got, so now I got three clients, and, uh, and within a couple of weeks, uh, uh, a friend of Steve that was a fireman came to me, and he wanted to be a rehabber. And so now I got four clients, and these these four guys are telling their friends about this, and and are you still banking these at the bank? I'm so, oh yeah, I'm banking at the bank. You're originating like the always, loan, uh, yeah, to, assigning yeah, the sell, loan to them. No, I'm I'm selling the loan to them. I'm okay, selling them a loan, and I'm servicing it. I'm performing. Bank's happy. They're in the lending business. Bernie's a performer. Bingo. So, didn't take too long. Well, and then. Uh, the light bulb came on. My biggest problems in real estate were in the down market with construction loans. So, well, now let's compare the construction loan with the rehab loan. The rehab loan is probably half the size of the construction loan. Mm -hmm. And it takes a lot less than half the time to get it finished and on the market. So, and I'm making the same fee, so I'm getting... <laughs> Uh, I'm not a scholar, but I could figure that one out. This is, well, I, can, I can do a lot more loans with the same pot of money. And, and so uh, I got rid of the uh, construction. I just faded out of the construction loans and, the, and this uh, rehab uh, uh, lending ended. So then uh, the joy was the next time we had a recession, I didn't get caught with all these half-built new houses that nobody's going to buy. My clients who had these little rehab houses, as the market was changing, they were unloading them pretty fast. They could get them sold pretty quick, and if they couldn't sell it, they could put a runner in it and go get a loan and pay me off. So for me, uh, rehab lending is a lot safer. For my clients, it's a lot safer than being a, 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 a new construction person. Now, those are two different worlds, mm -hmm. but, but for me and my one little, small little business, this was a much better business than construction lending. And so that started in about 1997, and it just, it just grew rapidly. And, uh, you mentioned 1997, uh, and I have, a, I have a letter of recommendation here from Raymond Sonnenberg, uh, dated February 23rd in 1994. You remember this? Oh, yeah. So I'm just going to read a couple of paragraphs here. Prior to your leadership of these two constituent support efforts, the alumni dance consisted of a dinner party for 25 couples while the golf tournament averaged fewer than 40 participants. Subsequent to the implementation and execution of your program, the alumni dance enjoyed over 1,400 individual ticket sales while the golf tournament annually was over, oversubscribed in excess of 200 entrants. Not only did the events become financial as well as school spirit success, alumni fundraising jumped from under $100,000 annually to $300,000 while enjoying the participation of nearly 50% of the Rockhurst undergraduate alumni. 
These benefits were realized in a span of approximately 36 months and helped set the stage for a, subsequent, for a subsequently successful capital campaign totaling approximately $10 million. Your brand of personal commitment and professional expertise is priceless. If I can be of help in any way, please let me know. Ray Sonnenberg. So what the, you said in 1997, now you're kind of rolling with making rehab loans. And then what, tell me about this. What, what, what was your involvement well, there? Was, he, he wrote that letter then, but that, that went back before that. Two, two stories quickly. I won't bore you with it. But uh, when I was a senior at Rockhurst uh, College in those days, uh, we had class dance. It was an all-male school. We had a class dance that was held on the campus. <laughs> the Jesuits weren't too much in social life. So, uh, so anyway, uh, so we were going to have a senior class dance, and uh, and a couple of us. Uh, I was the class treasurer, and and we said, you know, there's never been a big band at Rocker. Let's 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 guy. This is our this is our time. We, we got a we got a class fund, and let's let's so uh, somebody got a contract with the Jimmy Dorsey Orchestra. And uh, you had to have a down payment, so so we went to the controller of the school. We said we got this class fund. We need some of the money to uh, make the down payment on this dance we're going to have. <laughs> this is, these are Jesuits. Uh, they, <laughs> and the controller says, uh, "Well, no, you don't get any money for your class fund." I said, "Well, what's the class fund for?" He said, "Well, that's going to be your class's contribution to the college when you graduate." Oh, we walked out of the office. And <laughs> Three years we've been doing these events and put money in the class fund, and they're going to—that's our contribution. We, nobody told us it was going to be a contribution. So, uh, uh, class dance. So uh, there was no way the senior class was going to go out and sell all these tickets. So we—I uh, was a class officer. So we so we had a meeting of the class officers of all the classes, and we said, "Look, we can have a big band on the campus, but." We have to sell. We have to sell it out in two weeks to, to have the money to make the down payment on the contract. Just, just to, just to make quick. the down payment. Just well, well, we got, so, so we can't wait. We can't dribble it around. So uh, so we uh, we had uh, every class got guys to sell it. Well, good lord, we so, sold the ticket, and we said you got to buy the ticket now. No tickets at the gate. And, of course, a lot of people are reluctant. They don't want to buy anything until they see it's going to work. So, uh, uh, anyway, anyway. So how'd you get them to do it? How'd you get all the tickets well, sold? Well, hey, we, got, we got them sold. We got, we got them sold. Well, the, we're going to have a big band. We're going to have a big band. Well, it's going to be great. So, uh, so anyway, it uh, was in the school newspaper and everything, and we, we sold enough tickets, and, and uh, there's some other stories. But uh, essentially, that's the only big band I ever had at Rockers College. So 13 years later, well, what was the what what was your theory on that? Because you've I've heard this story before, and um, you're, you, there was there's a theory that goes along with it. No, I don't I don't I don't remember. I, maybe I don't want to. Well, share you said that. but you said before there were uh, the 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 alumni gatherings weren't a real exciting thing to do. Oh well, and now they we're, were fairly well, well, expensive. I'm talking about that's when I'm in school now. Thirteen uh -huh. years later, uh, I'm on the alumni board, and Ray Sonnenberg was hired to be the alumni director. Prior to that time, it would have been Jesuit priests and to do little events, and so uh, up to that time, they called. They had an alumni dinner or dance or whatever, and it, it was uh, twenty-five couples. It, it cost you twenty-five dollars. You went to the Glenwood Manor Motel or something. And you had a rubber chicken, rubber chicken dinner or something, and somebody played <laughs> records, and that was the big night. Well. This was an all-male school, and you can imagine the wives are not for twenty-five bucks. They go down to the plaza, the plaza three, and have a good Saturday night with a steak and a couple of drinks, and have a good time. They didn't want to go to this rubber dinner. So, Ray <laughs> says, uh, Bernie, when we went to school, we all lived in the parishes around Rockhurst. He said, it's several years later. Everyone's moved, and they're married, and they got kids, and they're farther away from the campus. And they're so far away now, they don't come around the campus, and they've got kids growing up, and we want these kids to go to school at Rockers, and they're kind of out there for it. we got to have something to get them on the campus. We got we know we're building things at the campus. It's a, it's it's we're growing, and and we got to get these people back on the campus. So I says all right. So 
So we'll have a party on the campus. I said, the problem is that we have to, we have to make the party so appealing that the wife can't say no. That was it, so that was the deal. So, so we did it this way. We got a budget, do your budget first, and for $1,500, I could get two, call it bands, for lack of a better term, I could, I could get two bands that people were interested in on the campus. Uh, the band for the older people played from 8 to 11, and the band for the younger graduate went from 9 to 1. So we're 8 to 1, that's we had five hours of music. We, 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 we promoted it that way. Uh, and I went back to this, this, this like, cl class deal. Uh, uh, I, uh, <laughs> I got a list of alumni, and, and I, I essentially called two people from every one of the graduating classes back, way, 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 way back. And I said, uh, here's the math. Uh, we got to have, uh, we got to sell uh, 300 $5 tickets, a couple. Well, I broke it down. So I'd call a guy and I'd say, uh, uh, I need you to sell uh, five tickets. And uh, the job is sell them. We're going to send them you. Don't send them back. You tell me now that you'll, 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 you'll send me $25 and have the tickets. There's, there's no, re <laughs> no returns. <laughs> Just tell me you do it. If you don't want to do it, fine. I'm going to call the next guy in your class and do it. I said, and, and, and your job is just to send the $25. Now, I hope you call your classmates <laughs> and have them come, but I don't care if you bring your bridge club. I don't care what you do. Send the 20 We've got to have the money. So we got $1,500. And we were able to have 300 couples come. That's 600 people. We were able to have 300 couples come at $5 a couple, $1,500. And for that, we provided for five hours two bands, Popcorn, soda pop, and beer for five dollars. <laughs> now, what wife <laughs> can top that deal? There's no topping that deal. There's no way. So, first year we had we had 600 people. You know, when the Jesuits send you something in the mail, there's always a a stamped envelope to send back your contribution. <laughs> That's the way the Jesuits have survived for five or six hundred years. That's just, they always ask for. So on this deal, we're not asking for any money. We're just having a party and we're having a good time. But we're going to hold it one month before the annual telethon, where every graduate is called up and asked to contribute to his college. So the theory is we're going to give him a good time. Then we're going to ask for a little contribution. So and, how'd that go? Well, it went, it went well, it's, 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 as Ray says. Uh, uh, well, let's start with the, with the party. We had 600 people the first year. We had 900 people the second year. We had 1,200 people the third year that were packed in like sardines. Well, if you want to have a successful event, you want to have them. Packed in like sardines. That's that's the successful event. If nobody shows up. It's not successful. Mm -hmm. so, well, yeah, back dinner. And coincidentally, I, I really didn't even do it. But 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 I got them there. I was, that was, that's what I said I would do. I got them there. And at the alumni telethon, I tripled tripled the alumni giving over over that same three year period. Wow. Wow. Just, just a coincidence. And you know, at the first year, the judges are wondering why are we having this party. Mm -hmm. For fifteen hundred dollars, mm -hmm. and we're not making any money. Mm -hmm. What? <laughs> that isn't the Jesuit philosophy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you made no profit on that party. Why would you spend your time doing that? Well, proof is in the pudding. So uh, that philosophy uh, of giving a lot of value for a, re a reasonable price—you've carried yeah. that into your business oh, yeah. philosophy as well. Yeah. And then you're talking about, you're a very practical guy, constantly talking about what does the wife think? And I've heard you had that conversation with numerous clients on the oh, phone, yeah. listing the house. Oh, and yeah. I've, I've heard you say, when the wife's walking through the bathroom, what is she going to think of that shower? What do, when she looks in the oh. kitchen, what is she going to think of this? Oh, well, you, the, my, rule, it's, uh, it's, my rule is this. Let's say a guy rehabs the house. Oh, just great job. The house in great shape. And... Uh, We've learned over the years that you have to do, depending on the size of the house, uh, 
you have to do a little bit of of of, of, of prepping it. You got to do a little bit. You got to put some trinkets in the kitchen and in the baths and towels on the towel holders and things. Because here's my here's my theory. I learned this back when I was doing construction. A little. Let's go back to the. When I, I was very young and I learned this one. Back in my uh, new construction days, uh, the builder's going to do a build job. So he meets with the people and they. They approve the plan and everything, and then he says, well, before I build the house, I want you to go over and see Bernie and, and get yourself credit approved for the loan you're going to need to buy the house. That's very practical. So they, so Saturday morning in would, in would come the couple, and, and, uh, and the wife would always be very bubbly, and the husband not so much. He's, he's kind of grim. And we sit down, and, and, and we go over, we take the, we do the loan application, and we eventually we wind up with the cost, the monthly cost that they're going to have, monthly payment. Oh, it's going to double. <laughs> it's going to double. And, and the, the wife's bubbly. Well, you know, that's great. And the husband's over there doing the math because uh, he's got to pay for this. And, and uh, he's, he's wondering whether or not his Saturday morning golf game is going to gonna give, gonna go in the way of a, of a second job to make this payment. So, you know, there's a bubbly person and the, and the one that's... So, so I learned... Uh, so I saw that as, when I was young. So now let's come up to the rehab lending business. Here's my theory. Uh, I could be wrong. I've been wrong a lot. Uh, my theory is the, uh, the couple drives up to the rehabbed house and they get out of the house and they get it to the front door. Uh, if the wife is not smiling at the front door, there's not going to be a sale. So you have to have a little, you have to doll up the exterior a little bit. Doesn't have to be great, but, uh, but, but uh, it can't be sloppy. Uh, then when they go through the door, naturally the wife's headed for the kitchen. Goes in the kitchen. She's got to be smiling when she leaves the kitchen, and the only way to make her smile is that well, you got it's got to be nice. But but I think you put a little, you kind of womanize the kitchen a little bit, put mm -hmm. little trinkets and things. Yeah. I've got one, I got one client that always has black appliances, and every time I see his house for sale, he's got the same red towel over the oven <laughs> every time, and but it works. So uh, so my theory is uh, the wife has got to be smiling when she goes to the front door. She has to continue smiling when she leaves the kitchen and she's headed for the master uh, uh, bedroom and bath. And when she goes through there, if she's still smiling, oh, you might have a sale. Mm -hmm. That's it. Mm -hmm. And due to my prior experience, it's my belief that at that point, uh, unless he can talk her out of it, uh, He's going to buy it, and she's going to move in, and his only option is whether he moves in or not. Because you know, <laughs> it's a sale. So how does the husband get out of it? He can't just say no. I don't you know. The wife says, "I want this one," and uh, he's got to rapidly go around that house and find some flaws. Uh -huh. That's his only escape. If he can find some flaws, then he can say, "Well, honey, look, look this isn't right. And just what else is wrong? You know, what's behind the walls? What else?" That's about it's the only way out. Now I'm a, I'm making all this up, but but, but I, I don't think it's I don't think I'm far off. No. So that that's that's my theory. So uh, this isn't a one man business anymore. We're, we're in the modern world. So our company has videos. We have videos about staging. Uh, mm -hmm. If you have a smaller every man house and you're a rehabber, you probably have some things at your own home that you can take over there and put in. You don't need to hire a stager. Mm -hmm. You don't need to spend a lot of money. You can, that's your choice. Mm -hmm. Maybe your realtor has a couple sticks of furniture that they can put in there. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, you generally go in a house and in, in the good old days they were beige and then it was gray or, or whatever. And so. If you go into an all gray house, got gray walls, gray carpet, you know, everything's gray. Uh, you better have some color, pops of color in there, just to womanize the house. Now that's that's the everyman house. As you go up the ladder into the more expensive houses, when you go out and do a million dollar house, you you better hire a decorator because mm -hmm. <laughs> that million dollar buyer <laughs> is all into decorating. So you have to you have to you have to hit your hit your market. But these are things we learn. So I know that you, as your career progressed, you transitioned from selling loans to banks to private investors. 
What prompted you to make that switch? As a result of the subprime meltdown, the banks uh, I have I have business, <clears throat> but, I, but these banks dried up. I don't I don't have any place to go with. I I, I don't have any money. The banks. I can't go to the bank anymore. The, the bank examiners have told these bankers to stop making real estate loans until the, the free fall in values uh, 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 stops. So, uh, and so they, they, they're going to do what the bank examiner tells them. So suddenly they're, they're not wanting to buy any more loans from me. And, uh, and uh, uh, what year was that? Oh, it was around 2008, something like that. Uh, well, no, it, uh, uh, maybe so, 2009, 2010, somewhere in there, they just dry up. I mean, the subprime is hit. Bank examiners only come around once a year, so uh, it wasn't an overnight thing. But, but eventually they, they figure it out that values are dropping. Uh, they're, they're questioning the value of the, of the real estate uh, that the banks have, and they're, and they're wanting re- new appraisals. How, and, uh, how long was it for, after 08, everything kind of falls out, well, it falls and it was out, that way for a it, couple of years? It takes, yeah, it takes a while for the, for the effect to hit, and, and the examiners figure out that uh, we, we're, we're inspecting these banks, and they're getting the theory that real estate values are dropping in the country, and therefore this bank's real estate loans probably have to be analyzed, probably have to have another appraisal. Because they're just doing, everybody's just doing their job. Mm-hmm. Everybody, the bank and everybody's just doing his job. So uh, eventually it winds down that uh, uh, the, uh, the banker is being ripped up by the bank examiner, and he gets to the point where he decides that for a while I better not make any more real estate. I better put my money somewhere else. Uh, I might have some loans on here the examiners don't like. I don't want to have a lot of classified loans. It, it affects what we can do at the bank. And so, uh, so I'm, getting, I'm getting resistance from the banks to buy in the loans. And so... Uh, 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 found a guy that had sold his business. Uh, that fellow had been doing some business with uh, Jim Alderman at North American. Uh, we talked to him. Alderman gave us a recommendation. I met with the man. Uh, the man said he understood. When, when, so when were you... I don't remember the year. The, how far into the, to the, the 08 crisis... Did you get before you started selling loans to a private individual? Well, it was when the banks dried up, but I don't remember the exact year. Yeah, aside from the year, I, I had no reason to. I had no reason to go anywhere other than the banks. I'd always, always gotten my my money from banks, but so, suddenly, I've got loans, and and suddenly the banks are dry, one a bank dries up, another bank dries up, and and suddenly we got to do something. So, uh, we find a guy that has sold his business. This fella had done some business with Jim Alderman at North American. Uh, I had sold, I had, I had sent a lot of customers to Jim Alderman. He's the number one uh, loan fellow at North American for many, many, many years. Uh, good reputation, uh, straight shooter. But if he tells you something, you can believe it. And, uh, and, uh, and, and this fellow had done business with Alderman, so Alderman gave us uh, uh, a plus. And so the man said, well, uh, uh, okay, he said, send send me a million dollars worth of loans. So we did, and then I didn't realize that both. So you're not talking about Matt Bartle right now. You're no, talking I'm, about your, I'm talking the, your about, other guy. I'm talking about the the first person. Then I didn't realize they both came from Alderman. Well, they didn't come from Alderman. The first fellow came from somewhere else, but he had done business with Alderman. Now Alderman okay. knows that I'm selling loans to this individual, and somehow he's. I guess he told Matt Bartle about what was going on. Okay. And Bartle was interested in the yield <laughs> that our loans are producing. And so uh, so uh, uh, I, I guess I get, a, I get a call from him, and he says he, he wants a loan. He's a friend of Alderman. Alderman told him to call. I'd like you to send me one of your loans. So, so I did. Then uh, uh, he took the loan. We booked it, sent it to him. It's on the books. Called him up and asked him if he if he would want to look at another, and he said yes, he would. So I sent him another loan. He said, uh, "Yeah, I'll, I'll take this one too." And I said, "Well, you know, <laughs> we haven't met each other, and <laughs> probably we ought to just just see each other." <laughs> so he's a uh, Mr. Bartle's uh, 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 
uh, what's the coffee? Uh, the uh, Starbucks. He's a Starbucks guy, so he wants to meet me at Starbucks. <laughs> so we meet at Starbucks in Independence, and uh, just down the street from all of his office. And and so uh, good, we meet, and and it just it just kind of continues on. So and you were working with another partner back at that time, is I that a, right? I had another partner, and so time passed, and the partner got upset with me. I'm doing most of the work. Uh, the partner gets upset with me because uh, uh, he says uh, I'm I'm calling all the shots, and uh, he's uh, he's at a certain age, and he feels he should be calling shots, and and. Uh, he he, uh, he he just said it was a problem to him. Is getting irritated. Uh, so I went in the next day. I'm not quick on my feet. I went in the next day and I said, "Well, here's here. Why don't we do this? Why don't we just part ways? And uh, you you take the first guy. You essentially found him. And uh, and 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 I'll go see Bartle and 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 I'll do business with Bartle and and, okay. uh, and and whenever it works out. I said it's not going to be an overnight thing." Well, at that point, uh, I'm older, and I want to have a younger person with me. And I had a fellow in mind, and I went to Bartle, and 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 so that so we talked. I said, but we can't do it now. This fellow I want to be my partner is a borrower, and you've got a couple of his loans, and I'm not coming with him as a partner until his loans are paid off with you. I don't mm-hmm. think that's good business. He said, okay. So a couple months passed, and then. And then Mr. Bartle called me and he said, "Come down. I want. I got another idea. I want to talk to you." So I go down to meet him and he says, uh, "I got another idea of how we ought to do this." He says, uh, "I don't want to take you and your partner." He says, uh, "You're older. Uh, I want you to, and I like your loans, and I want to have these loans, but uh, I want you to train my guy to do what you're doing, so that whenever you quit, you work as long as you want." Whenever you quit, then I'll have the loans because I want the loans. I like the business. I like the loans. And so I said, well, okay, let's make a deal. That's, so we work up a deal, and, and that's, that's, how, that's how you and I got started. Yeah, and back at that time yeah, in, in my life, I had met with, with Matt, and Matt's, uh, my brother uh, ended up marrying Matt's daughter, and they dated for eight years uh, leading up to that. Um, and at that time, I was running a construction company. And about six months prior to the time that you're talking about right now, about six months leading up to that, I went and met with Matt at his office. And I knew that my brother's girlfriend's father was this successful businessman and was smart operator. And I went and sat down in his office and I laid out all of the things that I was doing with my construction company. And it, they're just, it was a low margin business and it was a, there were a lot of different things I consulted him with. And he sent me home with some homework to try some things in the, in the operation. Well, six months later, I had no idea that you, this is where my story merges with yours. You're having this conversation with him. Now, here I am having my own conversation. had nothing to do with lending or mortgages. I'm trying to get advice for my construction company. He says, Tommy, you, you've tried these things, and I want to make you a proposition. I got this guy, Bernie. I'd like for you to meet with Bernie. And... <sighs> I'd like to offer you a job if you would be willing to walk away from the construction company. So I had to go back and do my thinking about that. And it, th- that's a whole other story. But long story short, I come in and said, yes, I'll, I'll do it. And that's when I first met you. You remember that, that day, yeah, the kinda, first, first yeah. day I came in and met you, yeah. met you there? Where, where was that? that Over was in Matt's that office? Was, that was in Matt's office. It was kind of a weird meeting. but uh, Yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> I felt the same way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know. Yeah. None of us knew what was to come. Yeah. You know? it, yeah. So anyway, so we struck the deal. And so uh, in you come. And, and uh, after a while, you learn the business. And, uh, and uh, we're doing things my way. And it's, uh, I'm, I'm just... Uh, one man band with you in there and you're learning and that's great and uh, the next thing I know uh, you're over there with a laptop don't tell the story about my feet on the desk well yeah you're over there with a laptop and your (laughs) shoes are off you got your socking feet up on the desk and you're you're pecking away with a laptop for about six months and I don't know what you're doing don't care so uh, anyway the business is going fine so the next thing I know you're creating a program to take what we do and to put it into a program, and so that's that's what happened. I couldn't. I'm not a program guy. I didn't grow up. Hell, I grew up. Uh, <laughs> first time I went into mortgage business, I have to give dictation to a secretary <laughs> who's 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 taking shorthand going out. 
and type in a letter with carbon paper and a yellow rail on paper. And uh, uh, when I went to school, I've got a business administration degree, but we didn't have a class on giving dictation to a secretary. I mean, that was an acquired skill. So, so there were no copy machines. It was a different world. So anyway, well then we get we go from we went from that from that period, um, yeah. and that was a whirlwind for both of us. And we had it. Yeah, I'm learning this business. You're getting. You're having to deal with having me in the office, which was a no, challenge. No problem. I'm sure. No problem. Um, and and I'm not. Uh, th- I'm not fishing for for compliments with the with the REIT structure. But in your perspective, do you think that it was a good decision and a good move for the company to switch to that structure? Is that it? Was that well, a, a, well, a plus? Well, in, in the in the first instance, in the first instance, I I. Uh, I thought it was a good idea, but I thought there's a lot of money to a REIT, and it's a, here we are with a, a REITs for a, is it REITs for a bunch of sh- of uh, office buildings or shopping center, whatever. It's a, I've never heard of a REIT for rehab loans in Kansas City, Missouri. I just <laughs> it's it's not making sense to me. But at the same time, we're selling loans to Mr. Bartle and several of his acquaintances. And they're buying these loans individually, and as individuals buy the loan, they have some personal involvement in, in the mm-hmm. loans. And if they end that and pool their money and put it in the REIT, they're going to get the same return, and they don't have this personal involvement anymore. And for me, it makes sense. They've got a life to lead, a business to run. They don't want to horse around with a with, with, with draws on, on, on rehab loans. They just want the return. And, uh, and uh, uh, so uh, I can understand the, their some reluctance because they're a little more hands-on with each loan, yet uh, <laughs> they're always getting their principal and they're always getting their interest and they have for years and, uh, and they're not getting that down at the stock market. So, uh, uh, it, it's, it's, uh, we haven't been messing up. And, uh, so all that happened is they, 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 they put their, instead of buying loans from us individually, they put their money in the REIT. They're getting about the same return in a monthly check that they weren't getting. They're getting a monthly check, uh, with about the same return and they don't have to be personally involved anymore. And, and that brings up the point of Fair monthly right. interest. Well, um, I, historically, we weren't doing that. Can, can yeah. you shed light on? Well, the... I'll, I'll tell you why. I, it's a, when I started my business in 1972, making construction loans, uh, I didn't. I, the banks that I'm doing business with are collecting monthly interest on their loans, but I'm a one-man office with a part-time secretary. I can't make any money figuring the interest on every loan every month. Asking for the interest and collecting it, sending to the bank and accounting for all that, mm-hmm. all that work for nothing. Mm-hmm. So, uh, uh, and I'd always been doing it at six months. So I went to the bank and I said, "Look, it's a six-month loan, due in six months. We'll pay you your interest at the end of six months, uh, and extend for three. Uh, and and I gave them a little higher interest rate than they were getting on their own loans." to compensate for the not earning interest on interest. Uh, they had a computer, they could earn interest. I didn't have a computer, so I, I couldn't, I, you know, it didn't make any sense to me. So, so historically, I'm, I'm doing six month loans with no monthly interest. So when this REIT comes about, and now we have to pay monthly interest to the investor, we now have to collect it from the borrower. So we had to sell that to the borrower but it really wasn't much of a sale because where else are they going to go? Every other hard money lender <laughs> that I know of is collecting interest monthly and always have been. We're, really, we we're just about the only game in town not collecting monthly interest. So uh, I don't really think we lost anybody. If we did, we didn't lose very many people mm-hmm. over going to monthly interest. Now, because we've gone to monthly interest, we're still underwriting the loans the same way we always have. Uh, never in my life have I made a loan to get a fee. Mm-hmm. That's just not, just what's the point of that? You're just killing yourself. Yeah. So we make a loan, we make a loan, we, we underwrite them, we underwrite them the same. We're not concerned with the fee. We get a fee as we go along, we do business, we get a fee. But, but you don't go down to the shop to 
shove a loan down somebody's throat so you can get a fee. That's not what you do. Mm -hmm. So uh, never had to do that, never will do that. So anyway, now uh, we're underwriting the loans the same way we always have, but we're not waiting six months to see whether or not the guy can pay anything. We're, mm -hmm. uh, we, we, we now, with, with the REIT, we, we have a hard and fast rule. If they're three months behind, we foreclose. Mm -hmm. So we have a margin loan, and we're going to foreclose if, if they're three months behind. If, we're, if we made the loan properly and margined it properly, you're not, <laughs> you're not going to lose now. Never say never. You're always gonna. It's a, you're always gonna have something goes wrong in, in life. Somebody's gonna get divorced. Somebody's gonna die. Somebody's gonna have a uh, uh, thing. Things happen in life. Nothing's perfect. Never and, will be. But, 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 but you, our loans are better in the in the REIT where we're doing them with the REIT than we were before the REIT. That's period. Same loans, same underwriting. It's just a better concept. Yeah, and. Yeah. As we over the last seven years, you and I working together, your role has has changed from the the day I walked in. You were doing everything. You're doing draws. You're doing yeah. underwriting. You're closing well, the loans. I'm you're a, doing the, the every single piece. What does that role look like for you now? What What well, do you see your position now? Well, let, let's go back to the beginning. I'm I'm kind of a unique guy. Having a one man band doing doing mortgages. Uh, typically, if you go into a, a go down to the savings loan or the mortgage banker, you've got a you got a loan originator, you've got a processor, you get somebody that the, 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 the business is, is, is chunked into, into departments because they're running a volume business. Nobody does everything. Mm -hmm. Nobody does everything. I had a banker one time. I, well, early on, I had these small bankers. I had a banker named George Gould that was the president of uh, North Kansas State Bank. George and a fellow named William Martin at the Westgate State Bank. These two guys were the only two bankers I ever knew that could do every job in a bank. Mm -hmm. They could have been the bank teller, they could have swept the floor, they could do every, they bought the bonds. They were very unique. These two guys could do every job in a bank. Mm -hmm. They were old, old, old guys. And the First National Bank of Kansas City, a big bank at the time, uh, would, would send a trainee over to Mr. Gould uh, for a period of time so George, that this would be this was going to be an administrative guy at the bank, general management guy, mm -hmm. because everybody else at the bank's pigeonholed. Everybody mm -hmm. else is either a car loan guy or he's this a farm loan guy or everything. Everybody at the banks just got a specific job and they get good at it and that's what they do. But these generalists, of which there are very few, they'd, they'd send this guy to George, and and George would teach the guy how to do all these jobs hands-on real fast. They were paying his salary, so George got a young, ambitious guy mm -hmm. free. Who's, so it worked out for George. George trained him. So, um, And that's that's uh, you. Uh, but that's, so that, uh, that was that, me. And in the mortgage business, I, I could do it all. And Alderman, I love Mr. Alderman. He's uh, he, he's a top loan guy in North America, but he can't do all of it. He, he's got processors. He's got, mm -hmm. you know, he doesn't close them. He, he goes out and gets, he's good at getting the business. He's very good at what he does. He's, boom, he's, he's one of the best there are. But, but, but I was a guy that did everything. Mm -hmm. so, so I understand the mortgage that, business. That's I can do all aspects of it. Your experience is a, it's a huge asset for, for our company because we're coming in. We've got the, I was going to say energy, but you've got as much energy as any 30-year-old guy that I know. I mean, you could talk circles around anybody, um, and you've seen so many things. But I've had the opportunity to come in here and to, 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 to hone my skills and try to build a business, but to have your depth of experience and the fact that you are the generalist that knows how to do every single departmental role. And not only that, but you've had decades of experience with it. That's a huge asset for our company. It's except, like we're a young company with a ton of experience. Except running that program. I have no interest. Yeah, that, I didn't grow up staring at a screen. In high school, Mrs. Molander gave me 70 in typing because she didn't want me back. But that program, <laughs> that program is your the, is the basically pro, your pro, brain. The program is, 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 is runs. And now that we're into this, the way we're doing it, uh, the program the way the program has been written, the program underwrites the loan so that we're making a better quality loan than I ever made. 
There's well, that's no, the power. No that's the power of an algorithm. But the algorithm is tailored off of all of these countless well, conversations that, that we've had. I'm so, but I'm, you know, I'm the buggy whip guy. So we don't do buggy whips anymore. But I was good at buggy whips. So, so yeah, I, I understand the mortgage business. I just don't understand and care about programming. It's kind of like back. I didn't want to be a bookkeeper all my life. I mean, mm-hmm. it's, there are certain things I don't want to do. And so, what do you do now in the company? And you know, I know, but well, for for our listeners, and and you go to our website and you'll see it. We specialize in. There's always somebody new coming. In. There's always a. We'll, we'll get a call from a fellow, and he says, uh, 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 "I own a house, and I want to fix it up and sell it." And 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 uh, well, where'd you get the house? Well, it's my grandfather's house. And then, then it went to my parents, and, and now it's, it's my house. And, but it needs to be fixed up for me to sell it. It's, mm-hmm. There's a lot of money there. There's a lot of wealth there. But, 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 but I, I can't go down the bank. They're not going to loan me any money. I'm a, so, so, boom, we, we take him, and we make a conservative loan, and he comes in and blows it through our program. Mm-hmm. Bingo. And, after, and after, he, after he completes that, now he's got, a, now he's got some money in his pocket instead of a house, uh, and if he liked it, he, he might come back and get another loan from us. I, I overhear you on the phone all the time, un, uh, untying some riddle in some real estate transaction. Yeah. That's such an asset for our clients to be yeah. able to have you as a resource. I mean, it, oh. I, you'd be hard-pressed to find some some situation in real estate well, that you haven't already seen several times. Well, I didn't invent that. Uh, when I was younger in business, uh, I did a lot of business with First Federal Savings Alone, and their attorney was uh, Bernard B. Levine, Bernie Levine, another Bernie. Mm-hmm. And I became friends with Bernie. Bernie was a uh, Bernie was the only guy I ever met that could answer my questions before I finished them. He was so quick. I mean, I'm I'm not quick. Bernie's quick. Uh, I had a very few foreclosures. He would do the foreclosure, and he got paid for the foreclosure. Uh, I would call him for advice. I would have a real estate question. Mm -hmm. I'm on the phone. Uh, I'd say, Bernie, this is Bernie. Here's the question. Give him the question. You give me the answer. I say, thank you, and hang up. This was less than one minute. Never got a bill. Never got a bill. Uh Well, uh, later on, I figured out, uh, Bernie was the the attorney for uh, First Federal Savings Loan, for Barney Car Bank, a nationwide commercial guy. (laughs) William Kemper, <laughs> he, was, he did a lot of work for William Kemper. He had a lot of high-powered clients and me. <laughs> so I, I felt, that, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd call him and I'd get these answers. And uh, uh, it, it, it's funny, we, we became friends. And uh, uh, every year I would take my wife out for the anniversary dinner and we would take the Levines. <laughs> and we'd, we'd have the two hundred dollar dinner. <laughs> Levine would always pick the place, and we always go. He'd pick a really, he'd really pick an expensive place. And so we go have our expensive dinner every year. Uh, so it's kind of funny to my wife. So she tells people, "Well, my anniversary dinner with my husband is, is with Bernie and Joan <laughs> Levine. <laughs> uh, they're wonderful people, and and uh, and uh, it's just 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 the way it worked out. <laughs> so I didn't pay Bernie any money, but uh, but we. Uh, 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 he got some dinners and a couple of trips, and well, you're the, and we had a great time. You're well, the now you're, I'm the I'm, you're I'm, the Bernie. I'm, I'm kind yeah. of the Bernie Levine in a way, cause right? I, just just because I've seen a lot of things. Yeah. And, uh, uh, in real estate, there's always a, 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 you know there's always a, a riddle. Just yeah. like these, go on our website and see the one about quit claim deeds. These people call and they have these deeds, and it's a you know quit claim deeds. Just one side of one piece of paper, and really, all you've got is the the guy that's conveying. The guy that's receiving, and the and 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 the ad and the address. That's all it is. Like yeah. buyer, seller, and address. And it's just amazing how you can mess that up, because you because you don't say uh, if you say the property is going to John Smith, you have to say it's going to John Smith, a single man, or John Smith, a married person. You can't just say John Smith. Mm-hmm. Fatal. Yeah. And, and people do it themselves. You know, it's so easy. You just fill in a couple names and an address, then they put the legal description off the tax bill that's 
not the way it ought to be. So And all, all of this yeah. advice, and this is why yeah. all of our clients so, love yeah. you so much. You, they call in, they talk to you, right. they are able to unpack whatever right. situation they have and get Tell the right the answer. Yeah. And it, for, for anyone who's watching who isn't already using Bernie as a resource, he is an encyclopedia of real estate situational problems and solutions. Bring your questions to Bernie. He, he could save you. We're not going to charge you for it. Bernie would be happy to answer your question. And it's just, it's a, you have a wealth of knowledge that's and not you, only a blessing to them, but for all of us in, in the company. And you don't have to take me to $200 dinner. <laughs> 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 I'm okay. I've had enough of those. <laughs> all right. Um, so I'm happy to answer them because, uh, uh, you know, you get people over the, over the little hurdle and they, uh, uh, I used to say this early, early on. I said, uh, a lot of my clients, like, like the plumber that's building his own home, the plumber building his own home out in the country can't go down to the bank and have the banker loan him the money. The banker just doesn't, that's, the, the banker wants to do business with the professional builder that he's going to do 20 loans a year with or something like that. He doesn't want to mess, he's not, he, his business model isn't built to deal with the plumber that walks in occasionally and wants to build his own home. Mm -hmm. But that was my whole business. I'm making, I understand the plumber. I understand what he's doing. He's essentially building a house for 80 cents on the dollar because he knows how. I understand that. I can relate to him. Mm -hmm. And then I can take this deal and I go down to the bank and, and sell it to him. Mm -hmm. because, you know, Bingo. So, I mean, that that's what I did. I was the man in the middle yeah. of allowing these two people just to do what they do and be happy doing it. I was the guy in the middle. Well, you know, and that makes me think of, of our, our plan for episodes in the future of this show. There are so many things that we could dive in on, different situations that have come up, and I'd like to do that with you. And we can we can sit down, put our heads together, and figure out, what are some things that people would benefit hearing about? Mm -hmm. We need to do some thinking about it. And we could do episodes that would kind of dive in on that subject and give you a chance to tell that story. What yeah. was the problem? How could they have avoided it? Um, there are just so many things like that. So I, I'd love to do that with you and, and just unpack as much of your knowledge as we can. There are a couple of short things in our blog. So go to, our, go to the North Oak Company website blog and you can read a, a half a dozen of these little vignettes, but I can expand on them. Yeah. Uh, but uh, they're all true. Uh, make it up. They're all, they're, all, they're all true little vignettes. Well, I'm, I'm looking forward to doing that here. We okay. can do it in a little bit longer format. But, uh, Bernie, it's, it's a blessing to, to know you, to have the chance to have lived the se last seven years uh, right alongside you. Um, we're, we're so fortunate to have you, and I love working with you. You're... you're <laughs> It's, you're you're just as sharp as any 30-year-old that I know, and um, it, it really is a joy to work with you, and I, I appreciate you taking the time cool. to, to do this with me. Hey, Rebels. We'd love to hear from you. Please take a moment to rate and review the Launchpad. Your feedback helps us improve and reach more listeners like you. We'd love to talk with you about how we can help, whether that's financing your next deal, or partnering with us as a passive investor. If you have any questions or would like to learn more, leave us a comment and one of our team will reach out to you.